may have seen these lines in the sky. Some believe these are concerning chemtrails and others just called a conspiracy theory. My biggest concern is the stratospheric aerosol injections that are continuously peppered on us every day. Is there but a I question? Just, uh, yes, how do we stop it? That is, it's not happening in my agency. You know, we don't do that. It's, it's done, uh, we think, by DARPA. And a lot of it now is coming out of the jet fuel. Yes, so, sir. you know, those materials are put in jet fuel. We, uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to stop it. I have been waiting a really long time to talk about this with you on here because it's sort of like a controversial topic as so it's seemed for the last couple decades at least. But the cat is finally out of the bag. Augustus Dorico, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, dude. So, uh, weather manipulation is on everybody's mind right now, and um, you make it rain, so I thought this would be a fascinating interview to be able to, to talk to somebody that knows actually what the is going on. Dude, I run, a, I run a weather manipulation company. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I, I know, uh, so on the one hand, I know a lot about the research that the United States is doing, that China's doing, that the Europeans are doing, that the Middle Easterners, Saudi and, and the Emirates are doing. But then also- So what if I told you that the weather isn't necessarily natural anymore, at least not like it used to be, that somewhere out there, companies are literally making it rain and not just metaphorically. Weather modification is not just this sci-fi fantasy that everybody has been led to believe for really since the 1940s. In fact, it's been around for decades, so let's go back to 1946 when weather modification was first born. A chemist by the name of Vincent Schaefer was working at General Electric with another scientist, Ivoring Langemeyer, and one day, Schaefer had this wild idea using a freezer and a little bit of dry ice to possibly control the weather. They weren't just messing around, they were seriously trying to figure out how rain forms and whether humans could actually make it happen on command. So in Schaefer's lab, he started working with this little cold chamber, kind of like a chest freezer that you may have at home to try and simulate cloud conditions. But the problem was his chamber was not quite cold enough. So he had a light bulb moment. He thought, hmm, what if I were to add dry ice to this? What would happen? Would I be able to create clouds? He was thinking of this because dry ice is essentially like frozen carbon dioxide. So he ran to wherever you had to go at that day and age to be able to get dry ice and brought it back to his cold chamber to grind it up and then drop it in. This was the day that our weather was forever going to be changed. Instantly, a cloud formed inside his cloud chamber. The supercooled water vapor crystallized around the dry ice particles, turning into tiny ice crystals. This was a huge breakthrough. Schaefer realized that if you put the right kind of particles, also called like nuclei, into the air, you can trigger condensation and maybe even make it rain or snow. But of course, you know, as any natural scientist, you gotta test it in the real world to see what happens. So Schaefer and Langemeyer loaded up a plane with six pounds of dry ice to fly over the Appalachian Mountains in upstate New York. Once they were in the cloud, they began just pouring all that dry ice out the side of the airplane. And within minutes, snow began falling from the cloud, making this the first ever case of man-made precipitation. And you know, this was the 1940s, an era of big experiments with nuclear power, synthetic materials, rocketing, and now playing with the weather. But Schaefer's discovery did draw a lot of attention. 
particularly from the military, they saw a strategic potential in being able to manipulate the weather. Farmers were also like, wait a second, can we fight droughts with this? And insurance companies wanted to know what kind of risk this new technology introduced. From that moment forward, our lives were never going to be the same. Weather modification became a real field of study. And since then, we've tried all kinds of, of cloud seeding agents like silver iodine, salt crystals, and even biological particles. But they all work off of the same principle. If you give water vapor something to cling to, help it form droplets or crystals and kind of like tip the scale towards rain or snow, then these clouds will just start dumping it. Now, if you're thinking, wait, if we can make it rain, wouldn't the military want to use that? Yes. They absolutely did. Well, I got a ton of questions. I know that, you know, we there's a lot of I don't it's not conspiracy, it's real, right? The Vietnam stuff we were trying to 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 prolong the monsoon season over there to give us some type of an advantage. Operation Popeye. What the idea was in uh, Operation Popeye, which is what we did in Vietnam, was to uh, extend the monsoon season, cause more precipitation over the Ho Chi Minh Trail to impede the logistics of the Viet Cong, right? So everybody knows about how we uh, were secretly bombing Cambodia. That was a big no-no. Not as many people know about um, Popeye. This was um, a top secret military weather modification program with the goal of making the rainy season in Southeast Asia even worse to try and flood out the enemy supply routes, especially the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So how'd they do it? Planes flew over cloud systems and seeded them with silver iodine, just like Schaefer's method. But this time, it wasn't about helping crops or stopping a drought. It was entirely about tactical advantage to slow down enemy movement, destroy roads, and keep the trails muddy and impassable for longer. And according to declassified reports, it actually worked. The project ran from 1967 through 1972 with the slogan, the 54th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron uh, in the Air Force. Their motto was make mud, not war. Because the idea was if you could flood out these supply chains, then you could prevent people, the Viet Cong, from getting to the lines and actually shooting bullets at people instead. So the idea was to drop rain. Interesting. Yeah. I couldn't believe that was actually the catchphrase. It literally made me stop and laugh out loud when I heard it. Operation Popeye stayed classified for years, but when the truth came out, it sparked a huge debate. It wasn't just about war tactics, but how far the governments were willing to go once they had the power to mess with the weather. But this raised an even bigger question that honestly we're still asking today. If you can control the weather, who gets to decide where that rain falls? So in 1977, the United States and some other nations came together to sign something called the NMOD Treaty. This is short for the Environmental Modification Convention. And yeah, it is seriously as serious as it sounds. The treaty basically said that no country can use weather modification as a weapon of war. No engineered hurricanes, no artificial earthquakes, no climate manipulation for military gain. It was one of the first international agreements to recognize that the environment itself could be turned into a battlefield. But here is the catch. The treaty only bans hostile use meaning that you can't use weather tech against another country. But it doesn't say anything about using it domestically or under the banner of peaceful purposes. So if a nation wants to modify the weather for agriculture, water resources, wildlife control, or even for defense, it is a very gray area. And with today's advancements in satellites, AI modeling, and drone delivery systems, that gray area is only growing. So let's jump to the current day, starting with China, because they're not playing around. Ahead of the Beijing Olympics in 2008, Chinese officials openly bragged about using cloud seeding to keep the skies clear during the opening ceremony. 
they literally forced rain to fall before the event so that it wouldn't fall during it. And it's only scaled up since then. China now runs the largest weather modification program in the entire world, claiming to cover more than half of the country's landmass. They've got weather rockets, artillery shells, and aircrafts all loaded with seeding agents, and even plans to build a network of cloud seeding burners across the Tibetan plateau to help increase rainfall in key locations. Then there's the United Arab Emirates, a country that gets less than four inches of rain per year. They have been investing millions into cloud seeding to fight drought and water scarcity. They use manned aircraft and drones to inject salt particles into clouds over the desert, hoping to squeeze just a little bit of moisture out of the clouds to refill aquifers and help cool down the cities. Some of their methods have actually gone viral. If you guys remember seeing those videos on Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook, those videos were actually real. They were not AI generated. It was videos of these sudden downpours in the middle of the desert, leaving people wondering what is natural and what is engineered. And now in the United States, we are seeing a new wave of startups entering the space of weather modification. One of them is called Rainmaker, the company founded by Augusto Dorico, who's featured in the interview that this video is based on. They are blending AI, climate modeling, and autonomous drones to trigger rain, not with rockets, but with precision. Yeah, so cloud seeding is just a way to make more water. It's super local in its effect. It's pretty well characterized, and, and we know that it doesn't have any adverse ecological consequences. Um, on the other hand, there is uh, geoengineering, particularly solar radiation modification. That is uh, a pretty new technology. Um, the way that it is proposed to work is dispersing particles in the upper atmosphere uh, to reflect sunlight um, and cool the planet down. Uh, Totally unlike cloud seeding. In order for cloud seeding to work, you need a big fluffy cloud that's already there. Uh, solar radiation modification, you just put it up at like 60,000 feet. Um, it's an interesting technology, but it's one that is like almost entirely untested and we should be way more scrutinous of and skeptical of before we deploy it at scale. Cause like, well, we don't really know what's going to happen yet if we cool the planet down by a degree Celsius. We don't even know if we want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So he says that they can target cloud systems more efficiently, reduce chemical use, and scale the process like never before. But here's another big question. If you can commercialize rain, who gets to decide where it falls, who pays for it, and well, who gets left dry? And here's where things get really complicated really fast because once you move water, you also move power. There are many nations who have gone to war over water. So let's say that one region plays for cloud seeding and it works, great, they get the rain. But what about the towns that were downwind that were originally supposed to get that water naturally? Did you just steal their rain? This isn't just some hypothetical either, it is currently happening now. In the Western United States where water scarcity is a full-blown crisis, I saw this first and in California when I went and toured the almond groves um, just after we had that huge honeybee colony collapse this year. Cloud seeding is being used to try and boost snowpack for reservoirs, but in a system that already fighting over every drop of water, cloud seeding raises questions like who owns the clouds, if rain is engineered upstream and the downstream region goes dry, who's accountable for that? And can a company just sell rain to a farmer while the next door neighbor gets nothing? And when it comes to regulation, there really isn't much. In the United States, there is almost no federal laws directly governing cloud seeding. If if nothing nefarious is going on with the with the chem and contrails, why do you think all these states are making it illegal? I mean, I know Tennessee just did it. I think a year or two years ago. A year ago, yeah, yeah. Um, so Tennessee did it a year ago. Florida did it just this year. It's actually a class two felony in Florida now. 
So uh, I would go to prison for five years if I conducted business in Tennessee and in, in Florida. Um, the the reason I think the reason why they're doing it is well, first of all, the Western states aren't doing this. They're not doing it because they're so desperate for water that they're seriously willing to hear out the case for cloud seeding, right? Like Montana proposed legislation to ban all weather modification and geoengineering. They still ban geoengineering, but they carved out cloud seeding because they know it'll be good for their cattle and for their farms and for their municipal water supplies and for their aquifers. Texas did the same thing. Um, the eastern states, you know, most people think of them as pretty wet. Like you don't need a ton of water, but um, actually Florida sometimes doesn't have enough. Like 30,000 acres of Miami-Dade County burnt down in April from wildfire. Most programs are state-run, loosely monitored, and often funded by private companies, including like ski resorts, energy utilities, and large agricultural operations. So at the national level, there really is no oversight, no environmental impact reporting, and really no clear framework for deciding what's fair and what's safe. Meanwhile, companies like Rainmaker are promising to scale technology using AI, drones, and satellite connection, potentially creating systems that can alter precipitation across entire regions. And as Augusto says himself, How do you see this getting implemented throughout the world as time goes on and more people open up to the idea? Um, I think that, uh, so our goal for the the operations between October 2025 and um, April 2026 is to produce 10 billion gallons of water unambiguously just in this one project uh, in northern Utah. If we do that and have all the radar data to back it up, that puts us at parity with the production of the biggest desalination plant in the United States. Um, if we succeed in that mission, then I think we're about two years away from becoming the biggest water utility in the Western United States. Uh, I think that people will think about water utilities and water production as something that cloud seeders do rather than like dam operators do. Um, it'll, yeah, it will, will be a huge utility first. Um, and then as time goes on, uh, as we get into all the other sorts of uh, applications, we'll probably work with crop insurers um, and farmers to help prevent crop failure. Um, we'll probably turn a lot more hydroelectric power online. Um, and then the fun terraforming stuff is kind of like five, 10 years away. And if that sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, it kind of is, <laughs> except it's happening right now. I never thought we would see a day like this today where it's actually a well-known fact that we are modifying the weather. So, we are left with a tough truth. We've figured out how to bend the weather, but we haven't really agreed on the rules. And in a world facing water shortages, extreme droughts, and climate instability, those rules are about to matter a whole lot more. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much. This is one of the biggest stories really kind of hiding in plain sight. A lot of people have been denying it, but it's come to the point that it is the information is out there if you look for it and it's only going to keep getting bigger so here is what i want to know from you should we be allowed to engineer the weather and who do you think should control it governments companies or no one at all drop your thoughts in the comments i read every single one of them and appreciate every single one of your guys's thoughts and comments that you leave and if this opened your eyes give this video a like so that other people see it too and if you want to keep unpacking how tech is reshaping the natural world well subscribe because we're only getting started so thank you for watching i'll see you guys in the next one and don't forget don't quit and be fit